Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. Hey, lovers of small business and good stories in general. Welcome to episode 56 of Small Business War Stories. I'm your host, Pablo Fuentes, and I am really excited today to share another episode from our Soul of America tour where we went all over the Rocky Mountains with my puppy, Muddy Waggers. And along the way, we stopped in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I had the opportunity to sit down with Sebastian and Robin, and they are both the founders of Dryland Wilds. And it's a really, really cool company where they basically take, they do a few things, but they take um, native herbs and native grasses and plants from the desert and make things out of them. They make soaps and they make all kinds of different cool products um, with them. And they also actually, we talk a little bit to host uh, tours where they take people into the desert and teach them about the plants. Uh, I still use uh, some of the soaps that they gave me. They have this amazing, amazing earthy, uh, it's very difficult to describe, but amazing, uh, you know, smell uh, to them. So Dryland Wilds is, was, um, they make really good products. And I was able to sit down with them and get their story. This episode is brought to you by FreshBooks. FreshBooks is a sponsor of the Soul of America tour. And with FreshBooks, FreshBooks is accounting software specifically designed for small businesses and service providers. So what if you could reclaim 192 hours a year of your precious time? What, they, what these people did is they basically calculated the time that it would take you to do, do things like invoicing, tracking expenses, getting paid online and all that. And what they've done is they calculate how much time you'd spend a year and it's 192 hours, and that's like two full working days per month. So with their invoicing tools, their online payment tools, uh, their insights that you get into your accounting and your books, uh, you can have more time to actually do either run your business or do the things you want to do. So check and check them out. They have over 5 million customers or small businesses that use FreshBooks. They've been a very successful company. Go to freshbooks.com slash war stories and then enter small business war stories in the how did you hear about us section so check them out the episode is also brought to you by proven proven is a company i started and it is a small business hiring tool where you can go and post your job to one place and distribute it to over 100 job boards and collect all of the applicants in one place now, Proven is evolving, and it's also turning into a small business information hub. We want to help you run all aspects of your small business. That's why we host this podcast. We are collecting stories and, and advice, but we also want to help you with practical aspects of running you know, the finances and the marketing and all different aspects of your business. So we're expanding. We have lots of amazing writers, uh, and we have lots of amazing resources at blog.proven.com, and we have redesigned that to be much easier to navigate. So check that out as well. Without further ado, I do want to get into today's episode, episode 56 with Sebastian and Robin of Dryland Wilds in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we are live here in beautiful Albuquerque, New Mexico. And this afternoon, I have the pleasure of sitting down with Robin Moore and Sebastian Rose of Dryland Wilds. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. It's so cool to be here. And I, I mean, I have so many questions. So the first thing, I mean, I want to hear, how did you first start making perfume from wild plants? What, what was the inspiration to do that? Absolutely. So we're plant nerds. We've been foraging since we were little, little kids. And... What we really wanted to do with this business was be able to bring some of that experience of being out in the wild spaces, these incredible desert wild spaces, yeah. and share it with other people who might not, you know, they might be trapped in an office all day doing great stuff, but still trapped in an office. Okay. And so we thought, how do we bring this experience to people? And we decided to do it through smell because it's so close with memory. Um, you know, you process, you process uh, smell and memory almost 
without any interference. Um, and it was just um, it was just a snowball after that. Basically, we were foraging and teaching foraging classes um, as well as farming. And after a series of like totally destructive floods, we took a look at what survived. Okay. And thought about, okay, well, what are the plants that are going to be going strong, um, looking at climate change and looking at what we're facing? And it was really these invasive and super common high desert plants, at least in this area. The those nuclear plants. cockroaches of that's plants. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. We're like, bring us to the cockroaches. Yeah. And thinking, how can we, you know, how can we make a living um, with these cockroaches and also benefit benefit the uh, environment? Um, Interesting. Interesting. So you first, how do you, I mean, I have, God, I have so many questions. How do you figure out if, if I mean, the, if a plant smells good or maybe it smells good, but it's poisonous and like, mm -hmm. I don't know how, like that, is that a, maybe that's a weird question, but how do you, no, that's an what's the process <laughs> of figuring this out? <laughs> that's a really important question. Um, we're lucky because we started with that knowledge base. So, okay. you know, when I walk somewhere, it's like, I can't shut up the record in my head that ticks off the name of every single plant we pass. Mm -hmm. So that's like my dad when I was a kid. Yep, yeah, th that's me. Mm -hmm. And Robin's like that with mushrooms and berries. Um, okay. But if you're experimenting with something that you're not familiar with, it's always really important to test it first on your wrist, and then you wait and you see if you have a reaction, and then you test it on your wrist. Interesting. So tell me more about this. Mm -hmm. So you pick up an herb if mm -hmm. you have a question. Mm -hmm. You what? Like open it, open it up or something, and then like put the. You, you, know, you want to crush it. You crush, crush it on it. your wrist. And right? this would be, I mean. This wouldn't be something you have like no experience with. It might be like, hey, I think this is this. I'm I'm 99% sure, but I've never seen it and I've never tried it. Um, yeah. So with that kind of background, you could go and you pick it and you squish it and put it on your wrist, yeah. and then you watch and you're like, oh, hmm, I think my wrist is okay. How long does it take? We usually wait about half an hour. Half so, an hour. Mm -hmm. Okay. By the way, I want to put a disclaimer that small business war stories is in no way, shape, or form <laughs> a purveyor of medical advice or anything to do with the consumption of plants. Exactly. Do not not do this at home. <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious. No, definitely. It's something that you need a lot of education in. Yeah, and you know, at least you're not eating them, right? So, yes, we ourselves, we're eating them. Oh. But we, yeah, we forage for food but you all don't, the time. You don't, yeah, you don't uh, encourage that sort of behavior in uh, everyday people unless you really know what you're doing. Yes, absolutely. You really have to know what you're doing yeah. and have a positive identification and then go through that yeah. test because mm -hmm. people react differently to different plants. Yeah. Um, even if a plant isn't technically poisonous, you can have an allergic reaction or some other thing going on. Yeah. So that's where then you would do Did you all read uh, Into the Wild? Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> For they, example. Yeah, that's a good example. Very with, good uh, example. Yeah. Don't die. Yeah. Small business. Yeah. Small Especially with audience. mushrooms. It's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys do anything on the, on the mushrooms front for, for what you do, or is that most Just for us personally. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. okay, cool. We put them as base notes and perfume, too. That's true. Yeah, we do, because we're coming out with a line of alcohol-based perfumes, and okay. we've been tincturing because we're up to our ears in porcini, so we have so many that we can tincture them, which is thanks to Robin. Mushroom season comes, and then she's gone. It's like production stops. It's like, wait a second, where's, where's my, where's my partner? <laughs> so you, you just love to go out and look for mushrooms? I do. I get lost wandering, looking for mushrooms with wow. my dogs. Are there a lot mm -hmm. of mushrooms in New Mexico? There are certain elevations. Yeah. You wouldn't expect it with it being so dry, but if you go up high enough, you can find them. Interesting. Do you also go to Colorado and other adjacent states or just mostly? We usually just stay in the area. Okay. Very cool. So you guys sell, um, perfumes. Mm -hmm. And then you also have soaps, right? Mm -hmm. And what other products do you sell? We do uh, our plant waters, which is a wild crafted hydrosol. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, hydrosol, are you familiar with the process of making essential oils? Uh, no. Yeah, um, so would you like to share that what thing? you would do is you would you know, take whatever plant material you harvested and you'd put it in a distiller. And then you'd add uh, spring water and what you get out um, is the oils from the plant and the water that's run through that process. Most people, they'll separate out the essential oil, they'll s sell the essential oil, and some people even throw away the water, but that, that water that, that's called the hydrosol has the amazing properties of the plant that you're using. So uh, we actually sell it as a facial toner. Different plants have different properties depending on your skin type. Um, like, for example, we do one with sagebrush. 
And sagebrush is an awesome plant. It's super antimicrobial, um, so it's great on like oily or acne prone skin. It's also great on like hands and feet, anything with a little extra funk, um, yoga mats. <laughs> uh, we take it camping all the time. Jiu Jitsu geese, Robin's feet. Jiu Jitsu geese? Like yep. a, a uniform? Absolutely. Yeah. I, use, yep. I use tea tree oil. Though. Yep, yep, yep. It would be good for that. It's yeah. a local alternative. Cool. Um, and then, so, and then we also, that's one of the ways that we extract the fragrance as well from the plants that we're using is through distillation, but we also have other processes as well um, to capture the essence of these plants. So what are the processes used? Distillation? We also use maceration, which is another word for infusion and in oil. Okay. And then we also use enfleurage, which is sort of an insane old way of capturing perfume, like the exact perfume of a flower. The reason you want to do that is because when you distill something or you are going to infuse something, it requires heat. And a lot of flowers, the fragrance is too sensitive for that. And so you end up with like a really muddy tone that you're not looking for. And on Florage, we built these chassis. You basically have a sheet of glass with a frame around it. And in the old days, they used to spread it with tallow. Um, supposedly deodorized tallow. We actually tried that. The perfumes ended up smelling like lamb stew. It okay. wasn't cool. Yeah. Um, so we use um, an unscented coconut oil. Yeah. And then you basically, since we're working with a lot of invasives, this is great because you need a ton of flowers for this process. Mm -hmm. So for example, Russian olives. In the late spring in New Mexico, that is just, it's an invasive tree. They bloom and the, the, whole, the whole bosque smells like um, this amazing, how do you describe Russian olives? This tropical, That's yummy. musky, sweet, spicy yeah, scent. Describing smells is so hard, right? It really is. Yeah. And so we take those petals, like we basically go prune, prune the hell out of the Russian olives and then go harvest off once we have these huge piles of flowering branches which people are thrilled to have us come take away because it means there's going to be less Russian olives next year. Yeah. We pick off the little flowers and then we press them into the oil on the glass and then we wait for them to wilt. It used to be thought that when the flower wilted that was its soul escaping and with enfleurage that would capture the, the fat would capture the flower's soul. You know. However you go about it, that's not quite, quite exactly what's happening, but the aroma molecules do get captured in the fat. And so you get literally the precise smell with cold on fleurage that you would with a fresh flower. And so after that process, we, we basically recharge the chassis. Um, so we go through and pull off all of the spent flowers in a couple days mm -hmm. and put those in alcohol. And then we put new fresh flowers on that. And then we do that about 10 times and we're, we end up with an oil, a coconut oil, that smells precisely like Russian olives. Um, we can use that as a solid at that point, it's a pomade, or then we add organic alcohol, very high proof alcohol, and then the scent molecules jump into the alcohol. And from there, you basically shake up the fat and the alcohol until all the scent goes into the alcohol, and then you evaporate off the alcohol and you're left with a teeny tiny little bit of an absolute, um, which smells exactly like the flower but wow so holy <laughs> okay my mind's blown so you basically let me see if i can say this back so you you take the flowers in, in a very long repeated process mm -hmm. put the flowers on the coconut oil then you shake up the coconut oil that has that essence into alcohol with mm -hmm. it and then you evaporate that off of the alcohol so you end up like yes that. Mm -hmm. yes you end up that and so Oof. Um, that sounds time consuming. It's, it's fun, but it's yeah. good when you have a big family around you. Yeah. <laughs> so. Wow. That's amazing. And so you're able to do this, you know, it's not distillation. It's really kind of a, an essence, uh, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, words are, I, words escape me at the moment, <laughs> but you basically end, end up with the essence of exactly the smell you're looking for. That's right. That's right. And it's a lot, it's a lot more pure than if we stuck those Russian olives in a distiller what we would end up with is eh, it's just kind of a muddy green smell and you go, oh, that's disappointing. Um, whereas if you put sagebrush in a distiller, it comes out you know, pretty true. Um, a lot of the aromatics, like the herbal aromatics come out of the distiller really great. So you guys are like aromatic artists, basically. You're just coming up with this, you know, you use the palette of nature to mm -hmm. draw. Wow. That's a lot more poetic than us, but yeah, that's, that's <laughs> us. That's beautiful. Okay, wow. And you teach other people how to do this? We teach other people 
the main class, the biggest, most popular class we have. That's your is, workshop, right? Is yeah, our yeah. wild our wild workshop. Yeah, so, I hear all about mm -hmm. that. Um, are our wild walks, which are basically we're teaching people the edible and useful plants in the high desert. Um, so we take people around and say, hey, you can eat this, or you can, you know use this on your face or whatnot. Um, that's really popular. And then we've had a lot of requests for some of the more detailed botanical perfumery. And we're building a larger workshop right now because the, uh, the space we were working out of, it was like, no, we can't accommodate this. So we would do private parties and go show people at a private party, but we want a space we can work out of too. But at okay. Spurline, that's awesome because we can do that here. Okay. We have some exciting stuff coming up in 2018. Here. Oh yeah, like yeah. what? So right. Spur Spurline is the, the shared um, retail slash workspace that we're currently in. Right? Yes, this that's is right. Where you have your shop. That's right. That's cool. right. Yeah. So um, we already did a desert incense workshop where people could bring work uh, work with all the wildcrafted materials that we brought and then make their own incense. But next year, what we want to do is actually bring the enfleurage chassis here during the Russian olive harvest and let people participate in it and actually take some of the pomade home. Um, and we're going to probably bring some partially charged stuff, some partially charged fat, so yeah. that you know, otherwise people so it have to take three weeks. Yes. people don't have to <laughs> sit in the community room for three weeks. Yeah, um, which would have its own interesting <laughs> things about it. And you might start meeting some of the soap that you that you, <laughs> that you <don't> carry. <laughs> okay, cool. So. If I were to show up to a workshop, what would that look like? I show up in the morning and then we take a van somewhere and then we start walking and you're like, and do I ask yes or no? Or do you start showing me? Is it a lecture? What is it like? Yeah, so it depends. We do shorter workshops that we offer for free and then we do longer, more intensive workshops that we charge for. Um, so if it was just a little wild walk, say here from Spurline, um, we have people meet here at the spot and then we just walk around the neighborhood and look at the common plants that are growing in an urban setting and what you do with them. Okay. Whereas if it was a longer workshop on say a foraging workshop, a wild walk, we would have you meet at a wilder spot and then we would take you out and the end of the class after about two or three hours, we would give you a list of things that you need to forage by yourself and we would meet you back at the bottom of the trail and see if you correctly identified them and wow. knew what they it's were like, for. Uh, it reminds me of like second grade. I, yeah. didn't, I didn't study. Where's my pop <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, but we really try to make it a full sensory experience because with plants, it's like you can look at it, you can learn the name, but you really have to get to know it. So you have to touch it, you have to smell it. And ones that are edible, you can taste it. But it's... It, it's really a lifelong learning process, you know, you can't, it, it, it's not something to take lightly or just mm -hmm. read a book on. So many of the plant identification books, the pictures are sort of weird, you can't quite tell, and so you really need those sort of hands-on experiences, um, and we hope with these walks to, to kind of light that fire for people to then go out and continue learning that throughout yeah. their lives. So plant identification, sounds to me like it could be something where a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing mm -hmm. right like you go on one <laughs> workshop and you're like oh yeah yeah i'm a plants identifier yeah well it. i mean we really we focus I, on our introductory wild walks we really focus on yeah. the ones that don't have a lot of look-alikes um yeah. that are pretty easy to identify yeah. but we definitely have you know our precautionary statements throughout the yeah. the walk and really just encouraging people to dig deeper into that because this is knowledge we all used to have as people um, and it's it is we also work with kids and it's amazing with kids that they actually they might not remember the name but they are way better at identifying the plant and remembering what its use is mm -hmm. so the earlier we can start this um, with people, the the more you you can, it just you you start walking and plants literally just jump out at you and you know. We're good at pattern recognition mm -hmm. as humans. I mean, that's just something we're we're kind of hardwired for. Yeah. So you know, it's once you get a little bit of it, it's hard to shut it off. Yeah. I mean, this this is yeah, this is the you know, uh, I guess flora version of the saber tooth tiger. That thing will eat me. You know, that plant <laughs> yep. will kill yep. me. Yep. 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 And it's you know, it's knowledge that's been developed and passed down, you know, for thousands of years and unfortunately in, in many people's are being lost. So we'll, we'll talk about the small business part a little bit more because I want to learn more about your business. But I have one more question and we're going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here. 
how do, what's the history of people doing this? Like, I've always wondered, like, how did people first, like, the, people must have died when you first started mm-hmm. identifying, you know, plants that didn't work. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, like, I don't know, you have, like, crazy things like, like the ayahuasca mix where people mix, like, one kind of bark with one kind of root. They're not even in the same place. And, like, those are the only two things that happen to work for that, right? Mm-hmm. Without getting into the more specifics of, of ayahuasca, like, what are the specific things in the history of this that, that have, like, how did people learn how to do this? I mean, honestly, it's it's just passed down. I mean, I, I learned a lot of this from my mom and my grandma, but um, I think that's where we're running into such a big problem these days because, you know, those connections, sometimes it's like if there's a generation that's having a hard time, then that information is lost with that generation. Um, and if you're talking, if you take it way back and you're thinking, oh, how did people learn that? Honestly, I don't really, I don't really know other than, you know, you get taught by stories, you get taught by, you just get taught by your elders. But um, I've always wondered if it was, you know, you watch people, what they'll eat. It's really interesting because when we're out foraging with our dogs, we're always worried. We've always tried to train them to forage with mushrooms that have nothing to do with it. They will not touch a wild mushroom. They'll eat anything, and they will not eat a wild mushroom. Mm-hmm. And I just wonder how much we as humans have learned from watching other animals and going, oh, okay. But I think a lot of it's instinctual, too. I mean, once you, you spend a couple weeks out in a really wild space, there's certain things that I'm drawn to and certain things that I'm like, no, and certain things that you're hungry for and certain things that, you know, you smell and it makes you want to throw up. Mm. So when you learn to sort of trust those responses and, you know, um, thank God we don't actually have to experiment and think, oh, <laughs> jimson weed, what lovely, luscious leaves. Maybe I'll try one. Bad idea, right? I mean, we don't have to do die. that now. You die if you do that. Yeah, you die. Bad. Yeah, mm-hmm. not a good idea. <laughs> bad, bad, bad. I don't even know what it looks like, but I know it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Uh, so, tell me a little bit more about you know the business side of this. How did how did you turn this from something that you love to do into something that pays the bills and something that you're uh, passionately growing here in the space? Well, we had um, left our previous job and we're just really took some time to reflect on what our next step was. And part of that process where we literally just wrote a list of everything we love to do. And it included, you know, being out in wild spaces, being with plants, um, doing something that our, our nieces and nephew could join us. Um, uh, ev- just everything that we're passionate about. And we just started there. And then we're like, okay, how could we combine that into a business? Um, so it was uh, it was a winter. It was cold. We were inside and just just started with just thinking about everything that was possible, um, and then going from there. Um, and this is what came out of it. it. You know, it's 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 changed and shifted along the way depending on different things that have come up. Like it first started as doing both the wild bath products and then uh, a wild food um, part as well. Um, but the process of trying to find a commercial kitchen space, getting insurance for that part of it really was like, okay, that doesn't seem to be and health code. Yeah. All that stuff. We're like, that's, that's a little much for us right now. Maybe we're also biting off too much. Um, so we're going to start with, with the wild bath products, um, and go from there. And that's actually been very, it's taken off much faster than we thought. Um, How long have you guys been in business? Month and a half. Officially, I mean, a, a little over, a yeah, month and a half. Wow. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah officially a little now. over a year. <laughs> over a year. Yeah. Okay. Cool. What has been the number one lesson that you've learned in that time for maybe people who are thinking about starting their own business, who mm-hmm. or who are out there? Um, you know what they say? What is it? The the uh, wise person learns from other people's mistakes. Yep. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the smart person learns from their own mistakes, mm-hmm. and the wise one learns from other people's mm-hmm. mistakes. I think we all do a little bit of both, but um, there is something that someone shared with with us when we first started, which was, um, you know, the opportunities will come, but they're never going to come when you plan for them. And so, you know, you can write your business plan, you can you can do all that sort of planning part, but uh, you just have to be super flexible and 
positive and just know that, okay, this opportunity is here. It w it's not when I would have necessarily planned for it. I might not feel ready for it, but it's here. And so I'm going to have everything I need and I'm just going to go for it. Okay. Wow. That's powerful stuff. So basically be ready to get lucky and it may not be at the time when you want it to. And Absolutely. Just do it. Yep. And just, just do it, it and know that it's coming to you at the time that you, you, you're going to be successful and you can just do it and it might not feel like you know exactly how it's going to happen but yeah. it will happen and no fear no fear no fear love it i mean that's most of it is just getting rid of fear and getting rid of your own sort of outlining on how you think things should go yeah. that's uh one of the definitions of a business plan have you heard this before mm -mm. this is the one guarantee of what absolutely will not happen <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> man i wish we knew that before yeah. <laughs> we worked so hard on that damn yeah. thing well, it's, it's a good thought process. It's, it's good to, you know, it's good to have that planning yeah. so that then later you can reflect on it and be like, eh, that's not quite how it happened. But, you know, you, you bring in elements and... Well, no, I think it's valuable to think about it. I, and I don't want to discredit business plans completely, but it's also, you don't want to overcorrect. Absolutely. You don't want to have it, you know, well, that's not in our business plan, so we can't do it right now. It's, right. you know, when those opportunities come, you just jump, you just jump on Tell it. Tell me about an example of that. That's well, okay, happening. so... Um, maybe t less than two weeks ago, it might have been a week and a half ago, uh, we received a call from, was it the producer? I think so. The producer of the show, TV show called Bizarre Foods. And they had heard about us um, through this ranch in Santa Fe called Las Colindrinas where we had been doing some of these wild walks. And they said, you know, we're going to be here basically next week shooting, um, and we want you to prepare a wild meal and go on a foraging walk with go on a foraging walk with the host, and then prepare a wild meal together. And this is, you know, this is in the middle of autumn, where in northern New Mexico, it's like, you know, you think, oh, awesome, harvest time. Harvest time actually was maybe three weeks back. So when he was like, yeah, acorns, I was super excited. I was like, well, we've already processed all our acorns. He said, well, do you have any unprocessed? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, God, mm, sort of. And I said, Robin, you know, run back up and see if we can get any more acorns. And so, you know, we were able to harvest a handful of acorns, but we had to pause all of our production. And this is our crazy time preparing for the holidays. Well, I'm flattered that so, I mean, I'm, I'm by no means a big producer. <laughs> sure you are. But I'm flattered <laughs> that you're sitting down here with me today sharing your story. Well, we were excited about this too. Yeah, we absolutely. love what you're doing. It's this awesome. is really important. Thank so. you. Thank you. Thank you. I love what you're doing. That's why we're here. Awesome. Well, and I think that's part of it is that having those build taking the time to build the relationships because uh, to me business is just about building relationships and if you don't take that time to really um meet with people and you know give your all to that in, in the moment that you're with them i think um you kind of lose in the long run if you're just really looking at okay i have a product and i'm going to market it and i'm going to sell it you it that's all part of it but that's a very good serious voice by the way <laughs> <laughs> that's all part of it but um you know it really is just about the amazing people that you meet whether it's your mm -hmm. customers or whether it's you know people who are helping you with marketing or what whatever it might be um it's just really an opportunity to to really celebrate what you're doing to have passion about it and to share that passion with other people and people respond to it mm -hmm. and the more opportunities that we have to do that um and really prioritizing that as a business i okay. think the better can you think of a time when things went really wrong and what did you do about it well you know <laughs> only <that> one <laughs> <laughs> well you can pick one no, no. um So we really didn't start off with a ton of resources or perhaps a ton of um, business skills. So we've really um, done really most of this on our own. Yeah, like bumper cars. Kind of yeah, thing. and mm -hmm. just it's like, okay, we'll go this way and oh no, maybe that's not going to work. Um, I think the biggest sort of 
uh, one was where we were first, we had our product, we had, you know, done all this research on the plants, we had developed these, you know, recipes for the, for the soaps, the balms, everything, we were good to go. We had our, you know, date on our business plan, this is when we're going to do product release, we need them to go, you know, to go to these stores, etc. And the part that we were, you know, needing to do was all the, all the design and all the labeling. And um, we'd been getting advice from some different graphic designers. It was not really our, our realm we had a lot of experience with, but we also had some sort of gut feelings about where we needed to go. Um, we so, had a vision of animals and outfits. We actually. had a vision of animals and outfits. We did. Vision of we did, and, and we did that for our soap. We did that for our soaps, and our soaps were awesome. Mm -hmm. And oh, sorry, I'm sorry, before you continue, <laughs> what animals and what outfits? <laughs> so if you look at our products now, each product features um, a wild animal from New Mexico. Okay. And they're dressed in an outfit. Okay. And <laughs> we had done this for, for our soap boxes, but when we were doing, needed to get the labels out for the rest of our products, we actually went with a design that was more focused around our, la our um, logo. And we released them, and it just, it, 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 we'd, we'd gone through it, we'd printed it, we'd taken them to stores, they were... Um, ugly, they were ugly. Thank you. They were okay. <laughs> um, and we just were like, okay, we put all this work, we put all this time, we put all this money into doing this, and it's just not right. And we're gonna have to pull them, and we're gonna have to come up with another design. And taking the time to be like, okay, that really sucks, but in the long run, I think this is the right yeah. decision, and we need to trust it. Yeah. Um, and we can't just beat ourselves up at this point and yeah. not go. Forward. And, and, and you can't mail it in. This is your life. This is what you're doing. You got to do good work. Yep. yep. So um, we pulled the funds together. We redesigned it, and we released labels that I think really helped consolidate. It's, it's still our, animals and outfits. It is still <laughs> animals and uh, yeah. outfits, but it is say. animal and al animal outfits across the board. Whereas before, it was kind of a weird mixture of things that weren't quite working together. Okay. So. Um, Looking back on that now, it's just like, oh, of course that was the right decision. Yeah. But in the moment, it was like we were just trying to move forward. That yeah. was not part of our plan. It's like when and you record a song and you like know that you could do like sing a part better or play a part better, and but you're paying for studio time. Mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, can I just? And then you like, just got to redo it. Do yep. it right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And there are some times where maybe it's not the right thing to redo everything, and you yeah. just have to do it. But in this time, it, it definitely was, and... It was bloody, though, because it was my fault, just to be clear here. No, it wasn't. It was totally my fault. No, it was yeah, totally yeah, yeah. my fault. <laughs> and it was... Uh... Well, okay, so let's be clear on something. When you're the, a small business owner, every success is a team, and every failure is your fault. So that's good. You can both <laughs> I'm okay. sure. I'm sure it's not nearly as bad as you guys think it out to be clear. It was, uh, it was like all of our capital had gone into this and then it was like, and it's wrong. So let's just back it up. And I remember when we had just received all of the beautiful labels printed, there they were, I opened them and I sat with them quietly. We were on the couch and I was kind of quiet and I was like, Robin, these are wrong. These are wrong. And I won't, there were a lot of expletives after that. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just gonna skip that part. Yeah. But um, it was a really good, it was really good that we decided to, and Robin, you know, a couple days later after she yeah. cooled down of being really mad at me, because I'd probably pushed the other thing in my memory, I'd said, no, 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 we need to push this, and then I said, no, back up, but, um... Did you guys have a label burning party? You guys should have done that. We should have. Yeah, just, like, do, like, have basically, like, you know, cleanse, <laughs> you know, take all the labels, totally. and, like, yeah. Yeah, that would have been a Maybe really we'll good idea. We'll have to do that when we get home. Yeah. yeah. You guys I, still I, they're stuck in the, in we the still corner have of the closet. We still have yeah, them. Yeah, we still have them. I, I, I think this is an opportunity. All right. We're going to do that. Yeah. Label burning party. For the new year. You know, there you go. New mm -hmm. year. You know, mm -hmm. get a nice bottle of wine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you, yeah. everybody has a fireplace here, so oh, I'm yeah. sure you guys have a fireplace. We'll do a bonfire. Multiple. By, yeah, we have go. three fireplaces. And one outside. Four fireplaces in our house. And one outside. Yes. There you go. Maybe use the outside one. Yeah, outside might be better. You don't know what's in there. Okay. Love it. How do you guys find your customers? What's your main? Is it uh, you guys do um, you know a lot of social media stuff? How, what is it? Is it word of mouth? How do you capitalize on that and, and help grow it? Well, we've uh, 
have sort of a multi-pronged approach. I mean, first off, when we had our product, basically, we just looked for stores in the area that had sort of a similar ethic to sort of our what we thought our product represented, you know, local, handmade, um, focus on sustainability, um, and really unique and specific to this location. Um, so we actually just like br literally brought our products into a couple stores and started from there. And luckily, you know, these also small business owners, these stores were super supportive of what we were doing, um, really excited about us, and it just sort of went from there. Mm -hmm. Um, we have an, you know, we have an online store. We do a lot of craft fairs um, locally and in sort of some of the surrounding states, um, and just those opportunities to really meet our customers face to face have been so helpful. Because, I mean, we we definitely get the plant nerds, the people that are just so excited to talk to us about all the different plants in our products and what the uses are, et cetera. Um, also people who just really love New Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. We have a product that is, you know, the smells, the authentic smells of that you get when you're hiking here. Um, so whether people are from here and have memories of that from their own experience or people who are visiting who are just really, you know, it's, it was a really unique way to get to know a place that you're yeah, visiting. I have to buy some of your soaps before I go back to Austin. <laughs> we brought you, we so. brought you some. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so yeah, we definitely, you know, you can kind of tell when you're at a craft fair and you see the, the people come by, we're like, I think this person's gonna stop. And once we have, you know, once they are attracted to what we're doing, I mean, we just we can talk for hours about mm -hmm. the plants we use and we were very passionate about what we do so once we make those connections there they mm -hmm. uh, they stick so okay. and then um, so what do you guys do on the social media front to sort of amplify this message beyond what you do yeah so we do um, it's it's funny you ask that question because basically we just um, you know we dropped out for about 10 years we said um, you know we don't want any of this we are not you know we didn't even have a cell phone. Okay. So it was just like, when we started this business, I was like, okay, you know, we need to actually get a smartphone. We need to get on Instagram. I cannot handle Snapchat. I will not do it. Um, I can't handle Twitter. So we made these decisions of like, for personal sanity, yep. what we can do and what we can't do. And um, just tried to learn that from the ground up with the help of some very, 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 very patient friends who were like, you know, you totally stubbed me 10 years ago. You know, now you want to be my friend. Okay, I see. Um, but who were really sweet and said, hey, you know, this yeah. is the lay of the land. This is how you do it. You know, because um, we know plants. We don't. We didn't really know social media at all. Yeah. Hashtag forage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Hashtag forage. Um, I remember asking someone, what's a hashtag? Yeah, exactly. Um, but cool. it's been really fun and it's totally, I've completely changed my perspective on social media. I really yeah. like the connection. I like the community. I really, you know, I um, I love it when we meet our Instagram followers, you know, just wandering around or at a craft fair or, you know, here at Spurline and like, oh my God, we're your biggest fan, you know, and they're like, oh, you, hey. So, you know, it's real people. It's it's not just some little box, so. Cool, very cool. Um, and so that's been an effective channel for you guys. Very, very much so. Um, yeah. How many followers do you guys have now? <laughs> Well, let's see. What do you know? I don't even know. It's a lot, though. Hmm. No, it's not a lot. It's um, we were really happy when we got over the the 500 mark. That that's <laughs> awesome. So no, that's I, great. I think we have I mean, like people miss it a little bit, right? So you could not fit 500 people in this very large room that you have right yeah. now. You'd be like shoulder to shoulder. You yeah. have to fill that entire parking lot. That's I, you know. I think so we maybe have 800 or 900. That's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, and you guys have been on for a year and you're gonna keep doing it. Keep, keep and we're supposed down. to, you know, we have this blog and I'm the one who writes the blog and I'm so busy with everything else that I'm doing that yeah. I know that is um, mm -hmm. a dear friend of ours who gives us a lot of advice on this sort of thing. He's like, you know, get that blog out every single week, get it out. And I was like, I can't, I can't. Yeah. Um, so that's something we really need to, to, to work on a bit more. Um, cool. Got the information, got to get it down. Well, I mean, if you were perfect, you wouldn't need to show up to work every day, right? Yeah, so that's there right. you go. You gotta be. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Where can people find you? So you have, um, you have the physical store here. Do you have, you sell mm -hmm. through here mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. Spurline? 
mm-hmm. that's in correct. Albuquerque. Mm-hmm. You also have other stockists throughout the Albuquerque area? Yes. Do you have a list in your website? Of we, do. Okay. we do. We do. You do. The Find Us tab will have find all us. that. Yeah. We'll have the, the craft fairs that are coming up that we're going to be at. We'll okay. have the stores that carry us. And then, of course, we have the online shop at drylandwilds.com. Okay. So people can buy things directly. Absolutely. Yeah. Before we sign off, how do you manage that balance? between selling directly and keeping your stockists happy? It's been okay so far. I mean, I think we're at a point where we actually sell more through the stores than through online. Um, But, because I think really people need to connect with the products first before the, I mean, most of the, the orders they that we get. It. It's yeah. hard to, you know, we don't have our smell a phone yet, but yeah. it's like, it's coming. Yeah, it's probably. coming. Um, so I think, and then also just making sure that, you know, it's not like, oh, well, um, we have a different price point or something, you know, just making sure that everything is, is across the board. Okay. If that's the price, you know, at our stockists, that's the price online. Sometimes it'll even be, if we have a sale online, there's some stockists who request that we extend the sale to them. Um, like, so we can have the sale at their shop and that's fine with us. Um, okay. but it's, it's been really great and we're really grateful to the, the folks who carry us. Awesome. Too, so. Well, you're doing an extraordinary job with something really, really cool business. It's so cool to see you succeeding at this. And thank you so much for sharing your story on Small Business War Stories. Thank you. Thank you. This has been fun. This has been great. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Small Business War Stories. If you enjoy the show, share it with a friend, or you can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our blog at blog.proven.com. If you have an idea for us, we'd love to hear it. Please email us at podcast at proven.com. See you next time. Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes.